Down Committee will now come to order. Hello, everybody. This committee has now come to order. If you'd like to have conversations, please take them outside. Do not take them behind that wall because we can hear you better from back there. Um, thank you, members. We do have a quorum. We have Council Member Reyes and Council Member Alarcon here. And as myself as the chair, that means there's three members present on a five member committee. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Perry. Uh, I thought that was that. Ms. Perry's here as well. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so we have a quorum. I will announce first an apology on behalf of the city to the public. The CAO report uh, was not made available to the public prior to today's meeting. Um, so, and there were many, many matters that needed to be clarified uh, as well. So with that, we will be putting item number four over until the May 2nd committee date. I'm sure some of the members have questions. However, it'd be unfair to the public for us to discuss a report that was not made available to the public. Um, so therefore, we'll put the item over till May 2nd. I would imagine that the committee members do have the report, uh, but it will give the public and ourselves an opportunity to review that report thoroughly before the May 2nd date. Uh, for those of you who did not understand what I just said, item number four, the CAO, CLA CAO report had not been made available to the public prior to this meeting, so we're going to put item number four over until May 2nd. Okay? Uh, all right. Okay, so with that, we'll go back to item number one. Okay. Item number one, will the staff please read it into the record? Item number one is motion Rosendahl Reyes and CAO to report relative to authorization to change the designation of the lead agency for the West Los Angeles Family Source Center Collaborative from Community Care at Home to the Latino Resource Organization Incorporated. Okay. Um, are there any questions from members of the committee on item number one? No questions? Okay, seeing none. Is there anybody here from the public who'd like to make comment on item number one? I do not see any public comment cards before me on item number one. Okay, therefore, public comment on item number one is now closed. So with that, any input from the staff? Good morning. Carolyn Weiss, Community Development Department. Um, I don't have uh, any particular statement to make unless anybody has a question. Okay. All right. Thank you. So with that, uh, the committee will approve the CAO's report. Okay. Without objection, that's approved. Okay, so now we go to item number two. Item, item number two is motion for Corey and Zion relative to a request to the city attorney to draft an ordinance requiring all landlords and property managers in the city to provide an alternate means of paying rent and any associated rent fees if an online rent payment system is adopted and to include in the ordinance mean by which the Los Angeles Housing Department can take enforcement action against landlords and property managers who fail to provide a non-internet means by which tenants may pay rent. Okay. So with that, we do have a handful of public common cards members on this item. Um, we have approximately a dozen cards. So with that, we'll give each person who filled out a card two minutes to make their comment. We'll open it up to public comment at this time. Uh, Larry Gross. Barbara Darwish, Monica Hujali, it looks like, and David, okay, David Darwish, okay. Those of you who I, when I call your name, if you can come forward, there are four chairs before us uh, where you can sit down and be prepared to speak. Uh, okay, please. Larry Gross, Coalition for Economic Survival. We fully support this motion. Last September, tenants living in over 30 buildings owned by Jones & Jones Property Management received notices informing them that a new online policy for paying rent would begin in December. Many of these tenants are seniors, disabled, and low income, and have lived in their homes for decades and thus are paying the lowest rent. In addition, many of these tenants do not own computers, are not computer literate, and are living on fixed incomes. This policy we see as nothing more than a scheme to target long-term low-rent tenants for eviction in order to obtain higher rents. 
Demanding these tenants pay online violates the rent stabilization ordinance, which prohibits a landlord from charging the existing tenants, uh, changing the existing terms of tenancy unless both the tenant and landlord agree to it. The problem is enforcement. It comes at the time of eviction. In this case, it would have to be for non-payment of rent, an issue you don't want to be in court defending, even if you have the law on your side. Now other landlords have upped the ante by demanding rent only by automatic uh, debit through the, the bank accounts. On the state level, Senator Ted Lieu introduced Senate Bill 1055 that were, would, would require all landlords to continue to accept rent by check or money order. We urge this committee to support this m motion, to put this into law lo locally, and ask that you ensure that it also includes the automatic debit protection and provides the ability to enforce prior to an eviction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Barbara. Hi, good morning. Barbara Darwish with the Fair Housing Coalition. I am against this online payment. And um, I have tenants who are 85 years old, and I've had them as tenants for over 25 years. And they pay me a cashier's check every month. They have no problem. And I think the online payment is ridiculous. And it's should it does not work, and I'm totally against this online payment. Thank you. Monica, you could use whatever one of those microphones. They all work. Thank you. Um, I find it perplexing that the city of Los Angeles that has a REAP ordinance will sit there and let anybody go in on foot uh, to pay their rent, whether it be in cash, cashier's check, money order, um, and take their money. And actually, the flip-flop side is a lot of those people don't even have a legal tenancy to the apartment they're in. But the city will take cash if they walk in on foot, but yet you're trying to propose an ordinance to apartment owners that really do want to support elderly people that sometimes don't have computers, et cetera, to take cash. And I find that that's a violation of a human being's rights. Um, so there's a severe dichotomy in the two forces that are working. In one hand, the city will take cash from anybody. It could be a monkey that walks in on the street and says, we know that such and such a building on a roster is in REAP. We live there. And what happens the, on the flip-flop side is we as landlords, if we have a building in REAP and we're working really hard, we're fighting with the city because they're taking money that don't even have tenancy. But yet, for legitimate tenants that are poor, that don't have a computer, that are elderly, that can't walk around, we're now going to be faced with this ordinance. I think it's a, uh, it's an utter contradiction to the skeletons and the systems that the city's already implementing in the reprogram. Excuse me, do you understand that this ordinance is saying that a landlord should not be able to only have one method of payment, which is to do uh, electronic payment, that the landlord needs to have other methods other than just electronic? The motion that's before us, I think, is saying a lot of what you're saying. It sounds like you're in agreement with with the spirit of this ordinance that's before us. Well, I don't think the city can jurisdict what type of mechanism, but I think we, sh we as landlords should have the freedom to choose and work with our tenants. If we want to sit there and accept cash, exactly. we, it, I, we, we this should This ordinance have is saying that, just so you know. Okay, well, and, and I'm verbalizing that. Okay. Okay, I also think that the city, if they're taking funds that don't have any knowledge of the tenancy, they should sit there and certainly investigate that. Thank you. Okay. David? Hi. Good morning. Uh, I'm against that. I think the, uh, I think the landlord uh, should take payment, any method they see fit. And if they are elderly people, they don't have computers, they don't have to pay it. And I don't think you should have any right to penalize a landlord on any method they want to pick up the rent. There are people who want to pay this way or the other way. The city has no business in this. And that's it. Thank you. I agree with you. The people should have different ways to pay. Um, next is David Cheney. Please come forward. Patsy Van, Van Dyke. Jenny 
Hillman, Margaret Beavers. We'll start to my right. Go ahead. Oh. Say your name for the record. Thanks. I'm David Cheney. Larry Gross, I can't believe this. You and I are on the same side of something for once. Now, I want you to remember this in the future because I, I, you know, I don't know what this is. I mean, I, well, I have my suspicions what this is about, making people pay by the Internet. However, I absolutely support this, that we need to have other ways for these tenants to pay their it serves two purposes. Number one, it allows, well, it's basically a matter of rights. The tenants get to choose how to pay. We get to choose with it, with them in concurrence how we will accept their money. I don't think that it's fair, fair at all. I mean, you know, it's, well, I see this with banks all the time. As you know, I've, my, my bankruptcy, you know, drama with the banks. They're always changing the rules so that you will get caught in some straddle somewhere so that they can fine you or charge you fees or whatever. So anyhow, Larry, you and I, I'm going to remember this. You and I are on the same page on this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, your name? Yes, Patsy Van Dyke. I'm a staff attorney with the Impact Litigation Unit of Vetsetic Legal Services. I represent um, a number of plaintiffs who have filed an action against Jones & Jones Management Company, the, the landlord who first implemented, at least the first that we're aware of, a landlord attempting to implement an online-only payment policy. We are um, gratified and thrilled to see that the City of Los Angeles is um, being so forward-thinking and has addressed this issue immediately. I can tell you that this is just the tip of the iceberg. We have been contacted by lawyers across the country now where landlords are attempting to do the same thing. Um, and it, as I would just reiterate, it's a question of choice. In fact, I took this battle on on a personal note on behalf of my mother, who was mm. with us from 1926 to 2009. Near once did she go to an ATM machine, let alone pay her rent online. And many of my clients, who are also sitting here, will tell you that is not something that they wish to be forced to do, and we don't think that they should have to. So thank you. Thank you. Next, your name for the record. My name is Margaret Beavers. I have lived at Woodlake Manor for 49 years and have always paid my rent by, by check. And then they gave us this letter. They wanted us to pay online. I do not have a computer. I'm not interested in learning how to work one at my age. And so that's why I'm here rebelling against paying online. And then when you get a certain age, they don't want you driving. And Woodlake suggested that we go different places to have our uh, rent paid online. But who wants to go to all these sports places that have somebody to input your dollars to pay your rent online? So I'm fighting against rent online. I want to continue to pay by check. Thank you. And we want to make sure you can do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming forward. Um, next. I'm Jenny Hillman, and I'm also a tenant of Woodlake Manor. Um, I don't have a computer. I'm a senior citizen. I'm on a fixed income. I'm trying to decrease bills. I don't want to add bills. I would have to go out, buy a computer, pay for Internet. I've been paying by check each month. and. The office is right there on the grounds. I don't want to have to drive somewhere to, to put my information in somebody else's computer to pay my rent. It's easy for me to just write a check, take it over to the office. And um, it just doesn't make sense. Um, we, should have, we should have been given a choice. We weren't given a choice. They just said, as of December the 1st of last year, you have to pay your rent online. You know, we're, we we had no choices, so we should have been given a choice, and I, I want to continue to pay my rent by check. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Reyes? Well, you just answered my question. I wanted to know if in the letter did they give you a choice, whether to pay online or not. If they did not, then you answered the question. Thank you. Thank you. They did not give us a choice, no. Thank you. Okay. And, and this motion is, in fact, saying that people should have a choice. We should have a choice. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much. Next, we have uh, Deedon Kamath. Sorry if I said it wrong. I can't read that writing. Daryl Brown and Jim Clark 
and Beverly Kenworthy. Please come forward. Okay. Start to my right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Jim Clark with the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, we at the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles are for this motion. <laughs> Um, we do not think it's uh, appropriate for uh, you mandate uh, that your tenants only have one one way to pay their rent, especially online. Um, maybe 30 years from now, we will be pay all paying online, but in the meantime, no. Uh, you know, we've always been of the understanding that state law, and I don't know the statute or the section, uh, mandates that landlords uh, offer at least two forms of payment. And we have, you know, basically been teaching that to our members uh, uh, as well. Uh, we are also in support, on record, supporting the Lou Bill, SB uh, 1055, which would uh, do somewhat similar, uh, create somewhat similar le legislation at the state level. And we support this uh, item as well. Thank you. Well, my name is Dino Kamasi. I'm a worker at the Wood Lake Manor Tennis Association. I'm also a programmer, producer at KPFK Radio. And um, our call to the behalf of the millions of tenants who fall in the apartheid zone of the digital divide. There is a digital segregation going on in this country. Uh, the logic of Jones and Jones is going green. That's their logic. If you take one check, put it on a page, okay, and we have 228 tenants, okay? You're talking about 228 checks that comes out to 57 pages times the court, and I have a Xerox machine that costs it two cents per page, you're saving a dollar fourteen cents a month by going green. Yet you're negatively impacting elderly, low income, fixed income people to save a dollar fourteen so called going green. You're throwing people like Margaret out in the street who cannot because they have eviction on their record rent an apartment in Los Angeles by going green. We're talking about hundreds of tenants, not just in Los Angeles, but this is being watched throughout the country by corporations that are utilizing this question of going green or going online, so-called going online, as a form of gentrification to throw out elderly tenants because there are rent control laws in Los Angeles where rents are no more than 3 to 4 percent a year, yet the objective market is demand because the housing crisis can make at a market level rents go up 10 percent. It's a way of throwing out long-term tenants like myself that have been for 12 years so they can make super profits off the bodies of the elderly women of low-income people. I uh, thank you. I'd like to also thank the Coalition for Economic Survival and BetZec for supporting our tennis association in this heroic struggle on behalf of low-income, elderly, and those who are victims of the digital divide. We thank you. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Daryl Brown, and I'm also I'm also a tenant of Woodlake Manor. I want to thank this gentleman for being here as well. I also want to thank CES and BetZec as, as well. The main issue I have is that we have some elderly tenants. There's a gentleman I just found out yesterday. He goes to dialysis twice a day. <clears throat> twice a day. You know how difficult that is if anybody's ever had to go through dialysis? It's hard enough just being an able-bodied person like myself. Now, my, the other grievance I have is when you want to try to subjugate someone to do something, we all know that as adults that's not going to work because people are not going to want to do that. Okay, now... Another thing that I have a problem with is not being given a choice. I thought this was America. I thought this was a democratic society, that we have a choice and a say in what we want to do and how we, would, how we should be able to pay our, our rent. Now, I think that we should be given a choice paying our rent online, by check, so on and so forth. That's pretty much the only thing I, I do want to say. But in closing, I thank you for your time. I thank CES and, and anyone else who's involved in this endeavor to get to get this point across. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. Next. Hi. Uh, Beverly Kenworthy, uh, the relatively new executive director of the California Apartment Association Los Angeles. Um, we also um, support this ordinance. Um, we believe that um, tenants um, should have a choice on um, how they pay their rent and which best suits them. So um, thank you. We're also supporting the uh, Lou Bill at the state level as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, that concludes the public comment on item number two. Is there anybody else here for public comment on item number two? Those are the public comment cards that were turned into this committee. So with that, public comment on item number two is now closed. Um, any questions from the committee?
Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Alarcon. I don't have a question. I just have a statement. I'm, uh, I'm deeply disappointed because I think that people should continue to pay by check, and when they get evicted, sue their asses because this is this is just wrong. The uh, the you know, and, and you even have the Apartment Owners Association on your side uh, because this is so bad that even representing landlords, they rec recognize that this is this is just bad. Uh, bad to do uh, when you start when you stop accepting cash as a form of payment um, and in this case I think most people probably pay by checks uh, I, I it just undermines our, our the whole premise of of, of any kind of uh, righteousness whatsoever so I, I would rather you uh, you you uh, get evicted and then sue them for uh, all the damages that they they create but uh, I'll vote for this uh, ordinance, uh, for um, Paul Kaporian's motion. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with much of what you said, but I'd rather you not have to hire lawyers and you just stay where you're at. You pay your rent. <laughs> you, you, you stay in your unit and not have to hire a lawyer, not have to go to court, and uh, that we at the local level and also at the state level pass ordinances and laws to make sure that landlords cannot think of tricky ways to get uh, people out of their unit. So with that, um, motion is to approve the motion. Okay, without objection, that item is approved. Congratulations. Okay, this is going to go forward to the council. Okay, next we go to item number three. Item number three is verbal report from the Los Angeles Housing Department relative to convening a series of meetings with housing providers and housing advocates to discuss issues related to the rent stabilization ordinance as requested in the Housing Community and Economic Development Committee meeting of January 25th, 2012. Good morning, Councilman. Ana Ortega, Director of Rent Stabilization. And I'm here to give you an update on the work that um, the groups have been doing. Uh, in January, thanks to the uh, efforts of Council District 6, a historic meeting was convened and included representatives of landlord associations and tenant advocacy organizations, plus city staff from the mayor's office, um, the CLA, and the housing department. We commend the chairman for helping to make that meeting a reality. It was really a unique gathering, and we all recognize that it hadn't taken place in quite some time. Um, at that time, the group agreed to work together to try to find common ground on the issues related to rental housing in Los Angeles. Subsequently, in February, another very productive meeting was held at the home of a, of a board member of AGLA, the um, Apartment Owners Association, and this meeting was also attended by landlord and tenant representatives as well as staff in the mayor's office, the CLA, and the housing department, including our general manage, manager, Rushmore Cervantes. At that time, the group reviewed some of the pending issues and, more importantly, in, uh, agreed to work on building trust and understanding between the groups and um, looking for areas of agreement uh, that where they might be able to submit recommendations to the council in the future. To that end, they identified two key issues that they uh, are working on. Uh, one of them is the rising cost of utilities, and the second was the development of a solution to the problem of nonconforming units. They also uh, agreed to explore the development of a mutual referral or ombudsman system to assist in resolving more difficult landlord-tenant issues between them. So they have formed themselves into working groups. They have held meetings. Um, they've been very productive. The utilities working group, for instance, is working on developing a set of shared principles between landlords and tenants. At this point, they report that they have additional work to do but are making good progress. We, we expect to gather the groups back together in May and uh, continue to work on the proposed mutual referral system and continue to work on issues to find common ground so that we can come back to you with um, additional recommendations on the RSO and other rental housing issues. Okay. So what started off to be historical cooperative dialogue has now become commonplace dialogue between uh, the different people in these meetings? I don't know if it's commonplace, but it's um, it's ongoing, very successful. But but they're actually they're actually talking to each they're other, not yelling at each other. They're actually listening to each other, not antagonizing each other Absolutely. in these meetings. 
Okay, uh, that's wonderful to hear. Good. Um, <laughs> take a picture. Take a picture. <laughs> it's a Kodak moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank oh, you. Really disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> now he's skeptical. What, what's going on in these meetings? <laughs> what's going on in these meetings? You right. this morning. <laughs> so um, we have um, 20 plus cards on this item, and on a, uh, item number five, we do have a handful of cards as well. We do have council that begins at 10. So we're, on this item, the public comment is going to be one minute apiece, um, and we will start calling people forward. We'll start with Carol Knapp, and then Michael Millman, Bill Huey, Larry Gross. Okay. Can those people come forward? Carol Knapp, Michael Millman, Bill Huey, and Larry Gross. Um, we'll start on my right. Go ahead. Uh, Larry Gross, Coalition for Economic Survival. We support this process and thank you, Council Member Cardenas, for directing LAHD to convene these meetings. And while there's inherent differences between tenant and landlord groups over some of the major issues, uh, which we may never agree to, uh, there may be other issues that we can, and thus this process is worthwhile. And we may never achieve a kumbaya moment, mm -hmm. though the, the item before seemed like we were close. <laughs> but uh, by talking, by talking, hopefully we're developing some degree of trust and open li opening lines of communication, which is beneficial to tenants and landlords alike, as well as the city in general. Thus, we, we ask for your patience and support to allow this process to play out. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, my name is Carol. Carol Knapp, and I'm with the Fair Housing Coalition. I don't own any rental property here anymore. I got rid of it uh, so I wouldn't have to deal with you all. And I have property in Lancaster. Um, I want to make it known that uh, because of your housing policy, I've been at this since 1987, uh, that we have decreased housing units, decreased rental housing units from about 720, 720,000 when I got involved in the 80s, to about 688000 today. So thank you very much for uh, raising the value of our properties. You made me a millionaire. Thanks. Um, and as far as seniors, come on. Uh, African-American senior ladies are the ones most attacked by this uh, REAP, and by the CRA, thank God they're gone. But uh, I know you're you're not stopping stealing. Uh, they retaliate. They always like to go after the weakest. Okay, you had a minute. Thank you. Uh, next. Yeah. Hi, I'm Bill Huey, I'm president of Fair Housing Coalition. Uh, what we want to do is, I know that. Uh, this, this committee has been meeting with other housing providers and other landlord associations. We would like to have a seat at the table because we represent a lot of landlords also. Uh, also, uh, I'm going to start hosting a local TV show on a major L.A. TV station in the very near future. So I'll be in a position to disseminate information to hundreds of thousands of people. And we're going to bring on landlords and business leaders to talk about how to do business in L.A., how to make L.A. more business friendly, because we all know that L.A. has been voted the most business unfriendly big city in America by the Rand Corporation and CEO Magazine. And if I can just say one other thing, um, I think it's a constitutional federal law that in America, if you have a bill to pay, like rent, you can pay in cash. And in America, no one can say we don't accept cash. I believe that's a federal law. I'm not sure. But we would like to be involved in any negotiations uh, regarding the RSO with the housing department so we can put in our ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, uh, good morning. Michael Millman. I'm from Mar Vista. I'm a housing provider. And I have to say thank you to the leadership in this room and downstairs. You got us the dialogue. Because you hang tough and said never again will that rent be less than 3%. When the tenant lawyers and the activists understood the 3% was preserved, they came to the table willing to deal. The credit goes to you. The credit goes to you. You didn't cave in on the step fees. You didn't cave in on the 3%. And now they're willing to deal. I don't take any credit. It was the courage of people in this room 
that wouldn't say no rent freeze in the three percent that got us this dialogue. I only can say thank you to the people in this room. Yes. Can I just say that I, I, I do not deserve this credit. I, thank you. Thank you. And, I, and I'll stipulate to that. I'll take some credit. Alarcón will not, for the record. Uh, <clears throat> next, we have Henry Ely, uh, Linda Kuo, David Cheney, and Luis Eisenstein. Okay, we'll start to my right, sir. State your name for the record. My name is Louis Eisenstein. I'm a housing provider. Okay, we'll start to my left. Go ahead. <laughs> You're right. No, 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 no. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, my name is Louis Eisenstein. I'm a housing provider. I live in Mar Vista. Um, we did actually have a meeting with the housing department. We met with Roberto Aldape and a bunch of other guys. It didn't go well. We didn't like um, his attitude. is very cold. Um, I could tell psychologically that he hated us, <laughs> and um, I don't think there's anything we can do with the housing department. It has to. You guys have to make the policy, and the housing department has to follow it. And the ordinance, the ordinances that you guys voted yes on, and your predecessors did, have affected us very poorly uh, these past 30 years. And it's a breaking point now, I think, with housing providers, with REAP. We, we, we get 90 days and our property gets stolen from us and put into an escrow account. That's not fair. REAP has to go. Thank you. Uh, next. Hi, I'm David Cheney. I was with Louie at that meeting, and I have to say, it was not a kumbaya moment as it is this morning in this courtroom. In this courtroom. Well, it seems like a court to me. I spend most of my time there. But, um, you know, the, um, I, I, Several things I would like to say. First of all, I, I really feel, I've, and I've always maintained, because I have tenants, almost all who I'm beloved, and you know, we mutually respect each other. I do not think that the problem in, in this city is between tenants and landlords. I think the problem in the city is between, ten, between landlords and the housing department and the different agencies. <laughs> Frankly, I, what I see all the time happening in this city is the tenants and I on the same page and the street services department, the fire department, the vector control, who, someone who someone will call if they get pissed off at you. All these different agencies will um, will make your life hell. And I mean, basically, I have a stack of bills at home like this for oh, for a fire inspection after I complied, and it's 300 bucks. One other thing, I, I actually did want to talk about this. I actually I talked to Garcetti. When we pay relocation fees, I would like the city to have a program in place for tenants to help to buy houses. I ha pay tenants to move and they bought houses with my money and there needs to be a program for that. You guys have money sitting there for that. Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, Linda Ko. Uh, I re help manage an apartment building in Koreatown for my mother. Um, I'm also a, a real estate investor and so I want to share with you what, what a real estate investor thinks about buying in the city of Los Angeles. Basically, I, I will not look or buy in the state of Los Angeles because of rent control. I will buy in another city because I get full control of my building. In the state of Los Angeles, I take the risk, I write the checks, but I don't get to set the price and I don't get to choose my tenant. So what happens is, if I think like this, I know all my friends and all my colleagues and all the investors I talk to, they also think this way. So when you have thousands of investors not buying in the city of Los Angeles, you are depressed, your, your property prices goes down, your, there's no exchange, there's velocity is decreasing, your property tax is lower, and therefore the city gets less revenue. And also, Yes, sir. Okay, I'm Henry Ely. Uh, I'm going to just try to crystallize things as quickly as I can. The issues for me, are between L.A. Housing Department policies and building and safety. For example, fees and penalties are outrageous. They are not proportional in no way, form, or fashion. Uh, you get the administrative shuffle when you try to get something resolved. For example, I've been to the city council. I've uh, hooked up with uh, Councilman Garcetti's office, and I was supposed to have a field representative serve as a liaison between myself and L.A. Housing. Nothing has been done there. For example, yesterday, Building and Safety came out and said what L.A. Housing had 
said I had to move again was done correctly in the first place. So now I have to go back and get another permit and do what was done initially over again because L.A. Housing countermanded what Building and Safety said. So I would like to have some type of order, uh, or some type of correlation between how Building and Safety works in relationship to L.A. Housing. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Barbara Darwish, David Darwish, Monica Huzari, and Jim Clark. Hi, good morning. Barbara Darwish. I'd like to make a couple uh, points. I'm a resident of Tarzana, and I'm a member of the Fair Housing Coalition. Number one, AGLA does not represent the majority of housing providers. Number two, AGLA and attorneys are in bed with the LAHD. This is illegal, and this is corrupt. Another thing, I had to sue the city of Los Angeles because the housing department told me to tear half of my building down. I prevailed, and when I was prevailing in court, they, they arraigned me on criminal charges. I spent over $100,000, and nothing has stopped. I'm, I'm totally upset, and I want to know what you're going to do about the housing department going after property owners for nothing. Hi, David Dowrish, and I will continue. You lost those two cases. The housing department with the RIP are throwing a lot of low-income people to the street. They're all homeless. And the funny thing is the city want to sue the banks for foreclosure. What about your responsibility? You, you're throwing people to the street, mostly low-income. Aren't you ashamed sitting here? And you're talking about housing. The housing department is all corrupt, missing money. We're talking to council people, no answer. We gave you two cases that the housing department lost. They are operating against the law. They are, they are criminals. What are you going to do about it? Can you tell me what you're going to do? There are a lot of people in the street you throw into the street, and you have no shame. You're trying to sue the banks for foreclosure. What about your side? Thank you. Thank you. Um, a similar situation. Uh, I have been plighting with the city of Los Angeles, Mr. George Eshoo, uh, who has reached out to Anna Eshoo, our congresswoman in Washington, D.C. We've been fighting at the Waldorf. I, as a caring landlord who just talked about wanting to support elders to pay by checks, have a building that has been sagging for three years. We sit there and are pleading with the city to red tag the building because we deem it unsafe. On one hand, the city is saying you've got to be a housing provider and make a housing building safe. We know as we sit here that that building needs to be totally jacked from the center and leveled and has to be completely evacuated to do it correctly. I've been put in this vortex for three years and we have plighted. George Eshoo has gone to the city attorney's office. On one hand, I'm a criminal for leaving them in unsafe uh, conditions, and the other hand, I don't get any support to evacuate for something that we're pleading that we know is completely unsafe. So if we want to have fair, safe housing, we need to have a simpatico relationship where we work together hand in hand. Thank and that's all we're asking. Thank you. Jim. Jim Clark with the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles. And just to address what the first woman said down the uh, earlier, uh, last time I checked our membership list, we had still over 10,000 members. So not only were we the largest apartment association in the state, we were also the largest local association in the country. Uh, with that said, I'd like to bring this back to what it was supposed to be all about, and that is the dialogue between uh, landlords and tenants. And quite frankly, I'd like to uh, kind of reiterate what uh, Anna Ortega said earlier. I think it's been a good dialogue. We found some things in common. Uh, yes, earlier today we haven't we we never discussed item number two, the the uh, online rent payment. But Larry and I have been talking about it, and we agreed to be here together in support of it. So with that said, not only are landlords and, and, and tenants talking on certain issues and agreeing on some things, but I think because the housing department is at the table as well, we might see changes over there. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Beverly Kenworthy, Elizabeth Blaney, Bobby Catania, and Steve Phipps. 
Hi, Beverly Kenworthy with the California Apartment Association. I just wanted to say, you know, since I'm new to this position, you know, we look very much forward to being part of this dialogue. Um, we think there is um, that's a very good start, and um, we've seen um, through other types of reform in the city where um, we can come to common ground. I mean, we're going full force on development reform, and I think um, if we keep this dialogue open, um, you know, I think we can make a lot of progress, and we look forward to being a part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Yes, my name is Elizabeth Blaney with Union de Vecinos and the LA Right to Housing Collective. And I have been a participant on the task force at several meetings representing the interests of tenants. And we are in the process of taking these baby steps to build relationships and trust and dialogue. And we did agree to discuss the less contentious uh, issues so we could find some common ground. But we are looking forward to really being able to address and discuss the issues at hand in the upcoming meeting so we can get to some of the crux of what really brought us to this task force to begin with. Uh, and in response to some of the comments that landlords don't want to invest in the city, uh, the other day in the downtown news, there was a study by USC that was published that we had in the last year the largest gain in apartments in the city of LA in the last year and that we have the second highest occupancy rate. So somebody is investing here and providing housing for LA. Thank you. Thank you. Your name? My name is Stephen Phipps. I'm a housing provider. And to me, it seems like the LAHD is only in business to do one thing, and that is to rule and regulate the landlords to death. And it really is ineffective, and it doesn't really provide any good things for tenants. It just makes the conditions worse in the city, and uh, people are not wanting to invest in residential properties because of the rules and regulations that never seem to end. And it just, uh, it, it's just outrageous that they could be dictated without even coming to an agreement with any housing provider. It's just dictation and rules and regulation to death. And it, it's just ineffective. So I think that the, the housing HUD should be eliminated and all these RSO and REAP, it, it's just a, uh, a way for the city to steal housing from hard-working people. Hi, my name is Bobby Catania. I'm with Infinity Real Estate. Um, I believe that the rent stabilization ordinance is a disincentive for owners, landlords, to uh, maintain their buildings. It creates uh, uh, buildings that are not maintained well. And um, I think that the only way that a meeting of this type can work is if the Fair Housing Coalition is there or actual landlords. The AOA and the AGALA, they don't, they don't, they don't represent us well enough because um, I just, that's the only way it's going to work, these, these meetings, is the Fair Housing Coalition or landlords um, are there at the meeting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Leonardo Vilches and Ruby Jerosian. Morning, Leonardo Vilches from Union de Vecinos and the Right to Housing Collaborative. And yes, I want to thank the council, the councilman for taking leadership in setting up these meetings and establishing this dialogue. But uh, the fact that the tenants and the landlords are having a dialogue and they have found common issues of interest that they want to work on doesn't mean that the larger issues that we were at the table for are still, had, to deal with, had to be dealt with still. Tenants are still being overburdened. There are still problems with the inspection processes in the community, and there are still conflicts, uh, some uh, problem landlords out there. So we expect the, the city to take leadership in addressing those issues that we don't have, uh, that we have in common, common. You still have to address the economic issue of the city, of the tenants being overburdened, and you still have to address the issues of not enough housing for extremely low-income people in the city. So while we talk, you still have a lot of work to do, and we expect you to do that work. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ruby. I'm a housing provider plus real estate investor. Um, I do have an issue with a tenants and housing department. I think the tenants, some tenants, I should say, that take advantage of the housing department rules. I think housing department does uh, not provide any kind of help to the landlords to maintain. Um, for example, I went in REAP because one of my tenants compl uh, complained about 45 times 
the housing department brought my bill to $12,000. After checking everything out, they charged me for the same inspection three to four times, and they put me in REAP. Even though I sent letters that I want to postpone my appointment, they will not accept that date, to, so they put me in REAP. Some of my tenants take advantage of the situation. Um, their request outrageous stuff. If I don't do what they're asked, I ha they're called inspectors, and I think that's totally unfair to the owners. I think it should be some sort of power to the, te uh, to the owners also as much as the tenants. I feel like a janitor, honestly. Thank you. One second. That, that concludes the public comment cards that I have before me on item number three. Public comment is now closed. Council Member Alarcon. Um, the staff, can come, if you can come back forward. Is, when, uh, when there are disputes um, in the, with the REAP program, what, what is the, uh, who, who resolves those issues? Is it the housing department? Or is there some other quasi-judicial process that people can turn to? And because everybody knows I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very supportive of tenants' rights, but but there are tenants that abuse the privilege, and and so who is who is the adjudicator for for this? Is it the housing department? Of the Rushmore Cervantes with the housing department. To answer your question, Councilman, uh, the the landlords are given notice uh, several notices as to the the items that need to be rectified and at a certain point is referred to the general manager's hearing officer who serves as a quasi judge and in those hearings that are public uh, the landlord uh, is able to present the case as to what they've done to remediate the issues or uh, uh, the deficiencies that were in those buildings at that time. And at that time, that hearing officer can either grant the landlord an extension time based on the evidence that's been provided, or mm -hmm. they can uh, deny the, the, the request and refer to the city attorney's office, and the city attorney's office thereafter would then uh, handle it from that stand standpoint and process. Okay, so, so these cases that uh, are mentioned here, um, did they go through that process, or? Uh, eventually, all rape cases, if they're not resolved, they will go to the the general manager's hearing officer, who then makes the determination at that point. And like again, it will go back into a uh, work plan for them to report back at a later so time, they, they, or they'll refer to the city attorney's office. So, in that one case where the the uh, the woman was saying that she needs to. Um, uh, Evacuate the building in order to to uh, fully restructure. So the hearing officer would take into consideration her her proposal and determine whether or not that that is necessary. Or that is correct. It is an example of it were uh, an illegally uh, uh, converted uh, room, uh, and uh, with the in this particular case, the hearing officer would demand either that the property owner bring that unit up to building and safety compliance or state building code requirements mm -hmm. or they, and that would require a temporary relocation or they could uh, instruct the developer or to the property owner to eliminate that illegal unit altogether. So there is a which process. Would, which would require... Okay, what, about, what about the cases where a uh, housing department is recommending things and then building and safety? The, the housing department does not recommend anything to the building and safety department. What the housing department does, it has all of the state building code requirements. And when it inspects, it inspects for irregularities, irregularities in the building. And if there are deficiencies that are identified, it is the burden of the property owner to work with the city's building and safety department to pull the necessary permits to bring that building up to code. So. It the gentleman said that uh, the housing department recommended he move something someplace, and then building safety said, no, you should have left it where it was. Or That's an unusual situation. I've given that gentleman my business card. I want to get uh, to the bottom of that particular situation to ensure that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing. I can tell you that the housing department has 
has downloaded all of the, the building code requirements into its tablets that goes out and inspects all of these units and actually is aware not only of the current codes but actually previous codes based on the, the, the year the building was, uh, was constructed as well because some of the, uh, the uh, laws are, the buildings are, are grandfathered in based on the year they were constructed. So well, we have a full that, knowledge of that. That's one case, but I don't think there's a council member in the city of Los Angeles that hasn't had to deal with uh, that kind of discrepancy between housing and, and building and safety. And uh, I think we really should take a look at it because there are there are inconsistencies. I, I would agree, Councilman, uh, you know, not only from the standpoint of the consistencies of what our inspectors are identifying, but also working closely with the Department of Building and Safety to make sure that we're on the same page. There is dialogue taking place now. There has been for some time. But obviously, I think when we have cases like this that are brought up, it, it obviously it just uh, it, it just highlights the need for continued collaboration to ensure that w the, the city is speaking with one voice. Thank you. Yes, um, um, Councilman Ray. You know, in the uh, past few uh, months, we've been learning about how some banks are foreclosing on property owners, and some of them are uh, renting out uh, units. And we have a circumstances where the foreclosure process itself is suspect. There's legal issues with the bank. The property owner is trying to maintain their property, but because of legal proceedings, there's issues there. And um, if there are problems with the property and they are trying to, now they have two fronts, one, the bank, the foreclosure process, and taking care of the property as well. Uh, is the housing department looking at those cases any differently because of these difficulties and how the banks have been moving very aggressively? And some are suspect of, of actually uh, moving illegally and or doing uh, the type of moves to take their property away. Are we looking at that in any special light? Uh, we do to a certain degree, Councilman. We, uh, the city enacted the foreclosure registry program, uh, which should, the banks are responsible for uh, registering all properties that have been either foreclosed or have issued notices of default. We, tr we work closely with advocacy groups uh, when complaints come forward where banks have for, that have foreclosed on a property that are uh, either they have inherited a property that has uh, uh, legal conversions or has deficiencies that have been noted for the previous owner or they're looking to, to uh, illegally evict tenants, then of course... But many of the property owners. owners in my district are, are mom and pop type. Right. I mean, they are on a shoestring, right. just staying alive, making sure the units are decent, mm -hmm. yet they're spending what little money they have to to get an attorney to deal with the foreclosure. If something goes wrong with the property, and let's say the tenant is working with the property owner, right. are we giving any kind of special? To or? that degree, no. We, we don't necessarily get involved to that level. We, we are pretty much an enforcement agency as relates to the habitability of the units, as a, uh, to the actual financial arrangements between the property owner and the banks. We don't necessarily get involved other than noting that the fact that they're, they've issued, it's, in this particular case, maybe a notice of default. So it's really the discretion of the hearing officer to show any kind of leniency or compassion for the property owner who's trying to do the right thing. Well, if you're referring to specifically REAP councilman, uh, that the hearing officer would have that would would have that case before them. But the, the, this case you were describing, I didn't, didn't think it was necessarily REAP. But within REAP, I can uh, tell you that one of the biggest issues the city has had is that you've got a, a high number of uh, properties that are mom and pop owned and it's a real catch-22 in that the REAP program where it be in some instances people look at it as being uh, draconian but it is an, an effective method by which to ensure property owners bring the properties up to code. What you have though is the problem is that you've got some mom and pops that by virtue of the rents not going to them, instead going to the REAP account, it does go into an escrow account. They don't have means by which to necessarily get a loan or have the cash to fix the properties. And we, uh, the House Department did come up with a plan at one point to look at providing some sort of grant program or loan program that would assist mom and pops with that, are, that have their properties in REAP. And we're right now, we're going to be coming forward in the next few weeks with a plan, for, but uh, a pilot would, that would utilize the monies that we've um, been able to make from the uh, foreclosure registry program that would be seed money for that. I understand, but if the property owner can show that they are fighting uh, an illegal or they're fighting against a foreclosure process because of the way the banks treated them, Mm -hmm. 
because of questionable practices from the banks or the financing entity. Uh, and yet, all they have is to fight that, and yet they have to deal with the property itself. I just, I, I would just assume that we would uh, be a little bit more responsive to it instead of being punitive. And maybe we should talk about that later. But, sure. that, but that's something that I, that I'm watching happen. Also. It's simply wrong to make people. Hold okay. well on. I know we're politicians up here, but we don't do things for applause. Please. Um, that was just a sincere dialogue. Uh, I'm glad that some people enjoyed it, but um, any other questions on this item? Okay. Yeah. I just want to uh, to say again that uh, you know I actually voted on the uh, establishment of the REAP program, and the the and and the discussion on the floor, uh, and during the discussion on the floor, I raised the issue of the concern that we would. Uh, spread our resources too thin going after small challenges and the most egregious offenders would not be affected um, and I'm just concerned that and I was promised uh, by by the makers of the motion that uh, that if that were the case that we would we would go back and redouble our efforts uh, toward the most egregious offenders, the, and, and the term was slam lords, uh, slum lords, slam lords, slum lords. So uh, what concerned me was you said that the goal of the REAP program was to get people up to code. No, the goal of the program was to get rid of slum lords, and there's quite a difference. Uh, there's quite a difference between there's quite a difference between a slum lord and somebody who's building has some code violations. So I would hope that the next general manager focuses on the slumlords and spends much more attention on, on even even if we allow some minor offenders to, to slide by, uh, but putting more resources on those who are creating egregious conditions in their housing stock. Oh, thank you, Councilman. The, uh the department applies the, 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 the inspections even-handedly, and certainly the buildings that are most egregious, uh, those are dealt with very swiftly, but in the same process. As it relates to a definition of what a slumlord is, we can certainly work with the, with the committee and council just to defining what that may be. But you've got to remember also, Councilman, is that uh, our, our role is to ensure that we have a safe habitable unit, irrespective of, of what okay. building it may be, whether it be a slumlord or, or a non-slumlord. Yeah. With all due respect, it shouldn't be equal. Okay. So, it shouldn't be equal. It should be based on the damages that are created by, by the landlord. If the, if the damages go to, to uh, an extent where there's uh, vermin infestation and, and all kinds of, uh, you know, Horrendous conditions, ceilings falling down. Right. Uh, well, those are dealt with. Extremely dangerous. It should be. It should be more extreme. It shouldn't be held with, uh, handled equally. Well, in those particular cases that you mentioned, those are handled differently. And okay. Those, those, well, we move for immediate uh, uh, vacancy, but we do handle those differently. But I'd, I'd be more than happy to to work with your office to define that. Well, and then again, we don't want to create homelessness. Correct. So I don't. That's not our goal. Yeah. Well, I understand that, but but we sometimes turn a blind eye toward the fact we're we're pushing 30 people out the out the door, uh, and and doing it under the auspices of trying to upgrade the housing when in fact all we're doing is pushing them out the door. I mean, there's I, I think we need to work harder at uh, solving the situation so that those people don't lose their apartments. Agree. Okay. Thank you. Um, seeing no more questions from members of the committee, I just want to instruct the staff to continue with the meetings with the stakeholders and also, in addition to that, uh, instruct the staff to prepare to uh, provide some written uh, report slash feedback to this committee, uh, even if it means an item where there seems to be um, a recommendation from that uh, working group that we actually make some changes or implement some, implement some policy and also the report should also uh, give us um, uh, 
information on what issues are still open and they're still continuing to to work through we do not want these meetings to go on forever we do want to make sure that we bring some closure as much as possible to matters and also have the recommendations before the policy making body of this city so we can actually move forward with some policy changes etc ok so just instructing the staff to do so and then keep my chair my chief of staff apprised of of uh, when you, you're ready to bring forward some written reports to us, and then we'll agendize those. Thank you. We'll okay. be happy to do that. Thank you. All right. Um, so with that, um, we'll receive and file that report. Yes. The, next, we I announced very clearly several times that item number four uh, was put over to the May 2nd date in the interest of time. And I, uh, without bringing up item number five officially, I just want to say that uh, for those of you who are not aware, the Department of Finance that reports to the governor of the state of California has announced that the monies that uh, CRA housing throughout the state that everybody assumed would go to the organizations that were actually overseeing that housing, they announced that the state of California would like to keep all of that money. So. So in light of that uh, and the developments on legislation that would uh, uh, are right uh, in the midst of affecting item number five, we'll put item five over. Um, we'll keep that in committee. Excuse me. We'll keep item five in committee as soon as we get some uh, clarity or light on the wow. real decision makers in Sacramento. Then we will agendize that item so the city of Los Angeles can have clarity as to what we can or can't do with that housing stock. So with that, item five is going to be kept in committee. Yes. Before you, uh, before you leave item five, uh, can I just put one, a couple of quick things on the record for when sure. it comes back? Um, we're unclear on the, law, on the low and moderate income housing funds being retained by the city, and I, I just wanted to make a motion to ask the CLA and the CAO when they report back to us in 30 days. No, we're going to keep it in committee. Okay. We have to wait till. Well, when they do report clear. back mm -hmm. with a more comprehensive plan regarding the transfer of housing assets to include an analysis on the housing assets and whether they could be transferred to a new economic development corporation once it is formed. That's all I want. Clerk, so maybe maybe what Ms. Perry may want to do is introduce the motion in council, mm -hmm. and then it will immediately be referred here and will concurrently Right. Here are those yeah. two I, those two uh, motions okay. when we bring it back up. Okay. No problem. Yes. Mr. Chair, and one last point. I know we have council right now, but I just want to put on the record, and I'll come in the form of a motion, that uh, I want the, uh, the CLA to work on and, uh, on evaluating and proposing uh, legal counsel on behalf of the community's interests and the CRA areas as they were formed, uh, given that we have one city attorney who's playing multiple roles, one for the city of LA, one for the CRA, and one for the community. And any of them, I feel there's an inherent conflict of interest. Uh, we should be able to, to analyze that. I'm asking the CRA to look at that as a, a potential motion that will allow us to have a, a better sense of how we look at our asset base, look at our community interests, and how we defend all the work the council has done throughout the years in the respective redevelopment areas. So uh, once again, I think um, once you talk to the CLA, uh, we'll have that motion. I just want to put that on the record, and we'll go in that direction. Okay, thank you. Um, so with that, that concludes the item scheduled for this agenda, today's agenda. And is there anybody here for general public comment? I do not have any general public comment cards before me. So with that, general public comment is now closed. This committee is now adjourned. <laughs>